Welcome to Scott Killaby's podcast, first podcast ever, Natural Recovery from Suffering. And today I'm going to talk about needs. And so I'm not an expert on needs. Like I haven't gone and done a dissertation on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I didn't study it in college. I didn't, it's not my specialty as a teacher or anything like that. We have to talk about needs when we talk about freedom because our needs sort of get in the way of freedom. Right. If I need you to love me, that might get in the way of me just being free in my life because I might go do a bunch of things to get your love or approval that don't even align with what I want. But I might do it anyway because we often are like that. Like we, well, we are all like that. The, the human animal is hardwired for survival, which means stay safe, get love with other people. And that's a need that we have. We think that we need to do that to survive. We actually don't. You can live on earth without a deep need for other people's love and approval or to stay safe emotionally. I call that enlightenment (laughs) or embodied awakening when you heal your trauma even. And you know, the funny thing, we non-dual teachers, which are teachers that point to the the non-dual nature of reality, that there are no divisions, no separation. You ask us a question and sometimes it's like we'll answer, we'll have an answer for everything. (laughs) I'm serious. Like through the years, I, I, I watched certain teachers and it's like certain teachers, there's not a question that they won't answer. And I'm like, well, your realization is very different than mine because mine, it just emptied me out of a lot of knowing. And you're over there answering like, well, quantum physics and you're talking, you're an expert on the hierarchy of needs. Like, God damn, your, your realization down, gave you a bunch of stuff that I didn't get. <laughs> the universe gave me a deficiency story over here. All I got is my simple, awake, present moment peace. And you're over there and you can answer all these questions. But the truth is, is we teachers don't know the goddamn answers. It's ego. Because really, somebody who's really clear can say, I don't know very easily. Because they don't have any emotional stuff around that on trying to be somebody who knows something. So if you ask somebody, who, if you you ask Buddha, I bet, if you could meet Buddha, hey, hey Buddha, um, do you think uh, that, do you know the answer to like why, how to split an atom? Since you're enlightened, I'm sure that the universe downloaded that very special information, (laughs) the Buddha would say, no, nor does it matter. I don't know what he would say, but that's how I see this, is we don't know more. We see more when we wake up. We don't know more. We see more. And so if I can answer questions from what I see in my direct experience and awareness making the unconscious conscious, that's different. But if I answer questions that are based in knowledge, like bits of knowledge that I've learned, well, that's not direct insight. That, I could be using that to stay safe or get love. right? If you, if you ask me questions about how to split an atom, if I can answer that and how to show you how to wake up, I am the best thing since sliced bread. I mean, shit, is it any better than that? A teacher who can wake you up and explain how to destroy the universe. (laughs) So, all that to say, I'm not an expert on needs, but I'm an expert on my experience, I'll say it that way, having done so much embodiment work I'm an expert in my experience to a certain degree because I think there's certain processes that we will always be unconscious to like what makes me you know I don't know all the processes that make me hungry in the morning or that's a those are unconscious processes that I don't need to know about but thankfully a lot of processes that are hidden on our bodies that make us do certain things they're discoverable like stay safe get love That kind of thing is discoverable. Like if I'm giving an answer about splitting an atom when I don't know what the hell I'm talking about to get your love, that's run by programming in the body. That kind of thing. 
but the so I can't be an expert. I can't purport that just because I've recognized the true nature of reality, I can answer all the questions about all human needs. But I can share my experience. And my experience also includes working in now between 14,000 and 15,000 one-on-one sessions through the years. Okay, so what I see is, a simple way to say it, is, man, we're not getting our needs met as kids. <laughs> All right, Scott, that's, wow, you really pinned that down. That's profound. <laughs> like, that's already been discovered. I'm not saying that that's anything new. But, we're, you know, point fact, we're not getting our needs met as kids, and our parents not being conscious enough to meet them can't. They can't show us what's really going on for us. In fact, they're often the reason that we can't get our needs met, right? I mean, let's talk about what needs are. <clears throat> it's one thing to have a need to survive, really basic needs. I mean, yeah, I need food. As a human, I need shelter. I need water. I need sex to procreate. I don't know if I need sex to survive. These are things that I need. And I would even argue that in certain economic systems, money is a need because without money, you can't get these things. Now, people would say, no, no, food is a need. Money isn't a basic need. But I'll just ask you this. Um, how are you going to eat today if you ain't got no money? <laughs> so I would just say, I, I, I mean, take a look at it. So that gets thrown in there. I think along somewhere close to our basic needs, but above that, and as long as our basic needs needs are met, like when we're little kids, one of my needs is to be able to feel and express my own emotions. I don't know that that's a need of mine. That's built into being a human animal. I'm just a kid, and I don't know I have that need, and I'm just discovering emotions for the first time. You know, I don't. I'm not an expert at emotions. Were you? And so when, when sadness comes up, I need to be able to feel and express that because that's a natural emotion. As a child, I need that. But if mom and dad are scared of that emotion, they can't meet my need. More than that, they're actually getting in the way of me meeting my own needs. They're not showing me how to feel and express that. So I'm going to have all the issues that would come with emotional repression, which is a driver for suffering when I get older, disease, chronic pain, seeking, addiction. And that's the needs that I talk about, is the need to be met when you're a kid, or the need to be met in relationship. And when our needs aren't met in that way, how does that affect us? If you think of this scenario, uh, one of my trainers Serena said this, it's a really good scenario, and I probably am going to butcher it a little bit, but she's saying, like, imagine you're a kid, and you're eating an ice cream, and, oh, no, excuse me, you're crying, <laughs> you're not eating the ice cream yet, you're crying, and mother looks at you and says, stop crying, and you don't know what's going on, you don't know that the crying is really scary to mom, or stressful, or you can see it in her face, but in other words, you're not crying to offend her. You're crying because you're sad. Or maybe you're crying to get your way or something. But mom, because she has an issue with sadness, maybe her natural response is stop crying. So before you even know it with repression, you learn in your system, if I'm going to stay safe and get love and survive here, I have to hold this back. So before you even know it, it's all unconscious or it's not something that you're conscious of, say that way. You stuff it back. And let's say she hands you an ice cream at the same time. So you learn right then that my needs, the need to feel and express my emotions are not important. My sadness is not only not important, that my mom is telling me no. And so I download that. I call that a command. We download that as kids and we learn in different ways to stuff emotions down. And so it, as adults, when we do emotional repression work, as the buried emotions come into awareness, we also, we also hear the conditioning that says, 
don't be sad, don't be just like mom, or stop crying, or don't be angry. All that conditioning is also buried in our bodies. And people often think that it's not there because they can't hear it in meditation. But our bodies are intelligent. They have programming in it, in them. And that programming comes from those experiences like where mom says, stop crying. And then with the getting the ice cream, it's like that's just teaching the nervous system that if you have sadness, if you eat this ice cream, it'll all go away. But it doesn't go away. Because just as mom's command to stop crying stuffs that emotion down in that child, the ice cream comes and stuffs it down also. And so the child learns in that moment how to live the rest of their life. Their whole life is, in some cases, is set in course because of moments like that. So now they're going to develop into a person who, if you want to get love from others, you don't show sadness. If you want approval, you don't show it. So your ego develops into an ego that doesn't show sadness, that might be tough on the exterior, or really smart, or some other thing that hides the buried sadness. And then like you might have an addiction on the side, or addictions as an adult, and you might, you may or may not have have traced it back to where you where you learned that if I take drugs or eat sugar I don't have to feel this and your whole life was influenced by these moments in which our needs weren't met or take the experience of like me I'm so innocent in this and so are you but when I was a kid before I was bullied because the, my main trauma is being bullied. Before that, I have memories of being in my household and with my parents, and I can't show anger. I know it, and I don't know where I learned it. I just know that when I didn't show anger, I got mom's love. I have mom and dad's. I have one memory where I'm angry, and I'm throwing a tantrum, tantrum and my mom says, you can get angry all you want. It won't make a difference. And when I look at my mom's life, all the anger that she had didn't make a difference. She had such issues with my father, and she was angry at him, and it didn't really make a difference because her anger was unconscious. And my anger was unconscious as a child. I was identified with it, but she couldn't help me with that. So she said, you can get as angry as you want, but it won't make a difference. And guess what I did from that point forward? And I don't even know if this is the memory that started it. I just have this memory. But guess what I remember doing from that point forward? Not getting angry because it won't matter. It won't make a difference. And so my basic needs weren't met. This natural resources resource that was given to me when I was born the capacity to feel and express anger and therefore to feel and express myself was buried to get mom's love. And then my life was a life of suffering. And I also then was bullied and kept the anger buried during that too. And in every other relationship, my needs weren't met. When our needs aren't met as kids, I think that's when we begin to develop, uh, develop an identity about ourselves. We probably have some sense about ourselves before that, but when our needs aren't met, when I can't feel and express emotions which are quite natural, can't you see how then we would identify with stories like, I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. I'm unlovable. I'm a victim. You see, because if we hold back what's true for us, we're forced to identify with what's false. If that little kid with the ice cream could have been more conscious or had conscious parents, that kid could have just cried and just felt and allowed it and let it transmute. And there wouldn't have been a need for that ice cream in that moment. 
And mom wouldn't have said, stop crying. So that child perhaps wouldn't have developed the identity that they're unlovable or whatever that is. When I was a kid, I learned that I have to be good and I hold anger back to be good. And so now I know that had I been able to express anger, I wouldn't have had to buy into the story that I have to be good. But I also wouldn't have had to buy into the suffering story that I'm unlovable. Because I didn't understand that these deficiency stories form or attach within us when we can't be ourselves, when we can't get our needs met. So we're forced into identifying with something that is not what we are and then suffer. All right. I'll, I'll talk to you in the next segment about what that means for us. If this is really the source of our suffering, like science says, if trauma and emotional repression is really why we're suffering, what do we do right now? What do you do right now if you're listening to this and memories are coming up where you realize that you couldn't be yourself growing up and maybe you're wondering or maybe you already know the extent to which that's created suffering for you? Stay tuned. There are other needs, you know, when we're kids. And I'll just speak to a couple of my experiences. So I've been gay since I've known what life is. And I knew I was gay. I didn't have a word for it way before anybody else did. Because it's a natural aspect of me. But, you know, I didn't have the power as a kid to say, in this household, look, I'm gay, you all. And you're not meeting my needs. This is a natural part of me. And I will not be in this household if you're going to make me suppress this. I will not suppress this. <laughs> There's no child that can really do it. I mean, God love them. There are kids who do take a stand if they feel like they were born in the wrong body or gender or whatever. But essentially, kids are powerless. And the parents have the power. And yet, if the parents are unconscious... If they don't recognize that a child has that sexual orientation or a gender issue, the child learns really early on to just stuff all of that down, including any anger or hurt or fear around it, and then suffer. Or like just being creative. I was a very creative kid, and I had parents who, for the most part, encouraged that, but my creativity was bullied at school. And so, again, I had to suppress that. But you can imagine that in households, creativity gets suppressed. A child learns that they like to do something, but dad wants them to become a doctor instead when they want to go create art or something. And as that kid who's trying to express themselves, is trying to let dad and mom know, this is what I want to do, they're still powerless because mom and dad have that power. We need their love and approval. So we're likely most all of us, and we do, just conform to what they want for the most part until we find enough freedom as adults to finally, hopefully, do what we want. But what I'm seeing is that there's just a lot of people well into their 80s who still have a lot of programming in their bodies where they're acting and reacting and responding to life from the repression that set in when they were kids. Like they're still people pleasers at age 70 and suffering because of it. So this is a lifelong sentence, trauma is. And we have it in our bodies until it's specifically neutralized. In other words, if, if you tell me, or if I learn when I'm a kid that my creativity is wrong, then I'm going to stuff that down for as long as I need to to stay safe and get love in all relationship. Because this is about survival. 
to the operating system. In other words, your conscious mind might understand that that you don't need to be creative to survive, like you actually just need food and water or whatever, but your system, your trauma doesn't understand that. It thinks that you have to hold back your creativity to survive, as if you're going to die if you're actually just yourself, your authentic expression. P people are going to hate you or you're going to lose them or you know how it works. So if we can really start to understand how bearing these emotions when we're kids because our needs aren't met is the driver for most suffering, the good news is, is we have a way out with our work without bypassing. But let me just tell you a little bit more of the story and I'll keep it to my experience because this whole thing about our needs not being met and how we become confused as we grow up as to how those needs are going to get met and how that continues. So for example, once we are imprinted with the trauma of childhood, once we learn that it's just not safe to cry, then we keep doing that. We keep holding that back. So by the time we're in high school, we're developing or have developed, you know, the ego. And so <clears throat> we are operating from some of the same trauma responses that were recorded in our bodies when we were kids. And by the time we're in high school. And we might be dating and having social relationships based on the repression. In other words, we're not going to pick people that... <laughs> bring us too close to the buried sadness or if we pick somebody like in a relationship that we love very much but we repress the sadness we're going to do a lot of different things to avoid that sadness some of us may be even afraid to date in high school because we're afraid to feel sad but we don't have the consciousness that young to know what's going on so we just keep doing it we go out we go to college into the workforce and we're all just Desperately trying to make it. And for what? Until we're clear, we're doing it still to get mom and dad's approval. As long as you have a deficiency story in your consciousness, like I'm not good enough or I'm unlovable, you're working, you're moving in the world to get love and stay safe because of programming that was downloaded in your body during childhood. You're working to get dad's approval. Many of you, not everybody. Why are we working to get dad's approval? Why are we working for that? Because we can't be ourselves. See, if, if just rewind. Go back to when you were a child. If you had the power, you would say, fuck you, dad, I don't need your approval. I am my own autonomous being. Thank you <laughs> for raising me, for giving birth to me. But now that I'm here, I have the right to be myself. And if I want to cry, I will cry. If I want to write music, if I want to create art, I will do that. We can't do that as kids. So we become disempowered. And then we become disempowered in every relationship, meaning we just can't be ourselves. And when we go to work and we suffer, it's because we can't be ourselves. Because if we could open to those emotions that we're holding back, we wouldn't feel the stress of work. We wouldn't suffer. We suffer because we're holding ourselves back. We're resisting natural emotions that we learned to resist a long time ago. And we resist those emotions at work. And when we resist our experience, we identify with false things. We go back to identifying with self-limiting beliefs, deficiency stories, and then that's what's working. Those stories are working. Those stories are in relationship. When we're adults, we're going after people as if they can fulfill our needs. They can't because we still haven't learned that other people can't fulfill our needs. Many of us think that people can. That if I just identify with certain things, they'll love me. 
and I'll get my needs met. But we don't ever really get enough love from people to feel the whole of deficiency because the whole wasn't created by other people. It was really created by the fact that it didn't feel safe for us to feel and express emotions. And that implicates other people, our parents. But by the time we're adults, our parents are usually nowhere around in our daily life. And we're still holding back the, those emotions for reasons that serve us. Stay safe. Get love. It's no longer about mom and dad once we're adults. We can't really blame them. It doesn't work. Because they can't became that way because of their parents. And their parents became that way because of their parents. It's an intergenerational cycle. In this lifetime, what I'm inviting people to do is to skillfully meet your own needs and stop suffering. How do you do that? Because we are programmed to think that other people will do it for us. That if I show up a certain way, they'll love me enough and I'll be okay. Or if I act this way and fake this and not be myself, they'll love me and I'll be safe. All of that's buried in the body. So let's say you're, in the, you're an adult and you, you date. I did this in my 20s. I was gay and I came out of the closet and I had this really great idea that I was going to go find a boyfriend. I wanted it my whole life. I just want a boy. I want to I wanna marry him. I want to have a house. I want to have kids. I want to come home every day for work and just kiss him. I want that dream just like everybody else. And I went looking for it. And I found heartache and pain because my needs weren't met as a child. And I was looking for men to fulfill the needs that weren't met. And they couldn't do it. It's not their job. I didn't know that. So inevitably, because they can't meet the needs that are my responsibility, they let me down. So the story goes, they hurt me. But because I couldn't feel and express the anger of my own suffering, I buried that, I buried that anger And I just chugged right along as an unlovable person looking for love. I kept doing it. I would fall in love with my, the band, the guitar player in my band. This was like, this happened three or four times. Probably four times. It's like I was just desperately looking for any human being that I could meet, that I could connect with. And if you write songs with me, we have a special connection. We spend a lot of time together. And as I would fall in love with them, and they, wouldn't, they couldn't give back what I wanted them to give me, it just reinforced the deficiency story. Because remember, I can't feel and express all my emotions. So whatever emotions I had to feel in those times when they didn't want me got buried more suffering. So as we carry the trauma around in our adult life, we're being re-traumatized. Until we're clear, we're just learning over and over that there's something wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with us. We just didn't get our needs met and now we're looking in the wrong places. But I kept doing this. I mean, this, this is a pattern. It's like, find a guy who's really attractive, love him to death, and then get hurt. And then believe you're unlovable. Get up. Do it again. Because you see, there's something in the very core of us that does want to suffer. But more specifically, just wants to stay safe and get love. And so if that means identifying with an unlovable story, I'm safe. 
and I can go get love. <laughs> I can get the love that I'm missing from other people. I didn't need love from other people. What I needed was to feel and express the emotions that I had buried. I needed to love myself. And I needed to meet my own needs. But that took me mm, about 50 years of living in some form of ignorance before I understood what it means to meet your own needs and to be awake to all that and to no longer believe that other people are here to make you happy. I'll talk more about that in the next segment. When I was younger and suffering, I didn't have the words like I have now for why I was suffering. But I can see it clearly now because when you heal trauma, it's like you reverse engineer your life and you're making the unconscious conscious. The unconscious programming in the body that holds your emotions back. It gives you the insight to see where your suffering has always come from. And I know that my suffering, the core of it is anger repression, which is fear of anger that was stored in my body. And then I developed an unlovable story because I couldn't be myself. Couldn't express anger. It's very difficult, I should say. I just didn't know uh, what was going on with me. So how many times do you bump your head or bang your head against the wall before you recognize you're doing it to yourself. I didn't realize I was doing it to myself until I got into spirituality and started to do inquiry and recognize that the, the reason, the first thing I recognize is the reason that I keep going after these men is because I feel unlovable. Like that's my identity. And somehow if I didn't have that identity, I wouldn't suffer. And I learned that, actually. When I got here, I learned from non-dual teachers that the, the source of your suffering is that identity of you think you're this or you think you're that. So I just go along with it, you know, just being a good spiritual seeker. And yeah, I need to, like, I need to question this identity. And I started to question it, and I even developed inquiries that more skillfully questioned these identities and when you would question them, they would just fall away. And then you would just see, oh, I'm the presence. I'm not these identities. And then, you know, I just living in that freedom. Well, it's actually a bypass because I didn't get to the repression that creates the identities. But so the repres repression is stored in my body and I'm just living in peace then. And now I'm teaching other people how to question identity. Now I'm a teacher turning around and saying, Hey, just question identity. That's all you have to do. It's really peaceful. And by the way, anger repressors love peace. So that was an easy sell to the anger repressors coming to seek enlightenment. And I don't mean I was selling it that way. I was unconscious, see? So I was pointing away from repression and towards presence to keep the stuff buried for myself and others, but I didn't know it. And I'm starting to even recognize that there's some needs that I have that are unmet as a teacher, as a human being. That when I first started teaching, there was still this low-level identity that would barely rear its face, but from time to time in some trigger. But I would actually see that this conditioning was involved in why I was teaching. And it was the old story of I'm unlovable. And that I noticed that when I teach and people like it, I get a hit of like chemicals. I notice that. And I'm like, oh, I keep doing this. Because this makes me feel better about myself. And I understood the incongruency of that early in my teaching. And I went deep into inquiry and essentially just put that identity to rest. Now I really think I'm awake, <laughs> right? Because now I don't even see the identity anymore. And I'm teaching from a different place at a certain point where it's like, I'm because I don't have that identity, I don't think I'm teaching to get your approval or love or anything like that or stay safe. I don't even think I have buried anger. 
So I basically think I'm done, except for a few things here or there. And, and that's the problem. <laughs> because repression is buried, and it produces identities in people that make them think they're done to keep them safe from the buried emotions. But I didn't know any of that. So there I am as a teacher. I've got buried anger. And I, I just don't understand how the reason that I'm there is because my needs weren't met. The reason that I'm taking the role as the teacher with this deficiency story is that my needs when I was a child to be able to feel and express my emotions weren't met. And because that anger was still in my body, it was producing a low level, I'm unlovable story, which was motivating me to teach. Until I cleared that, I even met a teacher later, years ago, who had a deficiency story because he couldn't become popular. And I said, you should really take a look at that because it can't be about popularity. If it is, it's coming from a sense of lack. And he just wouldn't look at it. And I thought, you're going to suffer, man. Because as Ken Wilber says, if you're going to go out and be a teacher, you better be super clear and you should be open to processing your stuff. I'm paraphrasing that. And, and, and I wasn't, I wasn't opening, open to looking at the repression, like so many other teachers. All because my needs weren't met as a child. And then I'm trying to meet the needs of the people that come to my teaching. See, well, a teacher can't do that. Nobody can. But I didn't really understand that. I thought I could be this vessel that points. And we teachers can sometimes point very skillfully in a way that does help people. But what I learned is that I have some responsibility when I come out to do that for people, which is to be really transparent. But with repression, I couldn't be. I didn't know I had buried anger. So I literally couldn't be transparent. If you see a spiritual teacher who can't answer personal questions or can't be transparent, that's repression and shame. Don't be fooled. Because real freedom frees you so much that you can just, you don't, you're not afraid to be yourself, whatever that is. You're not trying to get people's love and approval anymore. Those needs have been met within us when we embody presence. We meet those needs within us. So let me talk about awakening a bit and embodying that awakening. You know, I'll say this. This is one way to talk about it. For those of us who wake up, many of us teachers have been involved in either diseases, scandals, chronic pain, something because we still have unconsciousness, because there are still needs within us that were not met. So if you could imagine like just taking one scenario, if I'm a teacher and I cheat on my spouse, of course there's worse transgressions people would say, but that still happens where um, I don't tell my spouse. I didn't do this. I actually left my first husband for someone else, but I brought it out into the open. Not does it make it better, but I understood that hiding it would be my unprocessed stuff. But I could see how if I hadn't processed that, it's just safer not to tell the husband that I'm really attracted to somebody over here. Because I don't want to face my shit. And if I say it to him, you know, and I think that's what's going on for you've heard some stories about teachers cheating on their spouse from a trauma perspective they didn't have a choice that does not condone that that's just the reality of it because unconsciousness drives us to do things and we don't even know why we're doing it we know not what we do if we're really conscious of course we're going to turn to our partner and say i'm having certain feelings and i'm want to be honest about it because I'm sure that it, it's reflective of something going on between us and perhaps something from my childhood that wasn't met. And instead of hurting you, I want to talk to you about this. But if we're not conscious, we can't have those conversations. And so there's the cheating. And like this is the topic that nobody ever talks about because, well, there's a lot of repression in the spiritual community, so nobody really wants to question their teacher. <laughs> or if you do, well... You might be labeled as that difficult child in the family. 
But just as Ken Wilber says, if we're going to teach, we can't be perfect. Or I would add this to what he's saying. We're not supposed to be perfect. We can be people who make mistakes. But when we're teaching, we need to be transparent because we're teaching. And so if we have such transgression, it's important to process that and not just turn around to our own community and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm awake and whatever I do is okay. You shouldn't judge me. <laughs> I heard somebody say that, a teacher recently. No matter what I do, you shouldn't judge me. That's repression. People just don't want to feel stuff. So back into my personal life with my meet, so my needs weren't met. I didn't know how to meet them until I was 50. Because of the basic need that wasn't met is that I couldn't open to a natural resource, anger. And until I was able to open to that, needs just could not be met. In other words, I have a need to um, be myself. <laughs> I didn't know that I had that need. Or you could say it's a desire. I think a lot of us do, actually. I want to be myself. And that's been my path. I, if I can't be myself, I suffer. So I, in wanting to be myself, I don't know if it's a need, but in being myself, I do need to express things in relationship now. Because I've spent a lifetime not expressing those things because of the anger repression? Well, before I could express those things, though, I was still waiting for other people to fulfill my needs in subtle ways. For example, sex. I got in a relationship with Chester, who I'm in a relationship with now, and I find him to be the most attractive guy in the world. And I always say, like, if you don't see your partner as the most attractive person, damn, I'm sorry. But Chester has had his own repression and hasn't always been open to sex. And at times when I was unconscious, I thought that it was his responsibility. <coughs> We're married. <laughs> We're supposed to be having sex. And I was putting that on him, but those were my needs. And yet I had chosen this relationship. So I chose to be here and I've chosen, I'm choosing to stay with someone who can't at times have sex. And I have needs, and I don't want, and I have to express those, right? Because if I bury that need or that desire, then I'm, it's going to have, it's going to be anger, repression, resentment. So I learned through inquiry, essentially, to express these desires, to say, I really like sex, and I'm very attracted to you. I just want to jump your bones. <laughs> and when he would say no, in the first few times, it was a bit of a trigger because I, thought that he was supposed to do that. But then I realized I could just masturbate and probably do it better. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I can, but that's not the answer. The answer was that I needed to come out of anger repression. See, I needed to be able to say, in this relationship, this is what I want, sex. I also needed to do the work that once I express it, if I don't get it, I don't want to suffer over that. I might say it again and process any energy behind it. My job is just to be myself. It's not to assume that he's going to meet those needs. And being myself is being able to say and feel what I need to say. And being myself may be leaving a relationship if I feel like this is really important to me and I'm not willing to stay here. But all of that is my responsibility and not his. It's also my responsibility to masturbate and not his. And then when he's ready, when he's open to sex, that the loving thing to do would be to actually wait for that. <laughs> right? To pressure him is to put so much weight on him. Like as if he can make me happy? No. It's not his job. It's not your job. It wasn't my parents' job. It's not his job to meet my needs.
And had I been unclear about that, we might have broken up. Because I like sex. And by the way, we do have it. Just maybe not as much as I would like. We have an open relationship, so I learned to, through honesty, share openly about sexual things that I was doing and that he, from time to time, did. And that, again, is authentic for us because I don't want to be the, the spouse that doesn't express their needs and then cheats. Or if I did that, I would want to process it. But instead, what I wanted to do was to be able to say to him, you know, I think that there's certain needs are not being met, and I want to process that, but I also want to, I want to be honest about it. And then that starts a conversation, see? And those kinds of conversations have kept Chester and I together. Whereas if I would have just said, fuck you, I'm not going to express my needs here, and I'm going to get them met somewhere else, that is detrimental to us, and therefore to me, to him. Meet me in the next segment as I round this out by talking about the solution to this unmet needs problem and what the pathway is, because we're looking outside of ourselves for this, and we're coming up short constantly. The solution, well, that makes it sound like there's a problem. This is our operating system. This is how we have survived, you know, by having a fight, flight, freeze response in the face of real physical danger. If Once you make the conscious the repression, you'll see that it's doing the same thing in our relationships when we're not actually in physical danger. So our systems um, act as if an emotional trigger is the same as a physical threat. And it acts accordingly by storing emotions and holding things back to survive. That's what the conditioning you'll actually discover in your body. I'm holding this back to stay safe. So none of this is conjecture or even theory. You're going to find out for yourself that this is just your operating system. It's our operating system. And so therefore, it'll help you maybe change the context when it comes to the solution. Because there's not, it's not a problem. This is just our system, how it works. So we want to make conscious that part of the system that's connecting to our emotions. The, the, syst the part of the system that says it's not safe to express anger or hurt because that's not true, except for when it's actually not safe, physically safe to do that. Otherwise, it can be safe in a lot of different ways. It's our system that tells us that it's not safe. Because we learned this, we were conditioned to believe this. And it's hard to talk to people who are on a spiritual awakening path who are in repression because it's buried and they can't see that this is the source of the suffering. Quite often... So all I can do is point to the suffering and say that's there because of programming that's buried in your body that's producing it to keep you safe. Even though it sucks and even though it's painful, the suffering, it's safer than what you've buried. So like I said, the unconscious will produce cancer, chronic pain, emotional suffering. It sees that as safer than the buried emotions. And that's why we keep suffering because we don't see that. One, that this is our operating system, it's just unconscious in our bodies, and two, that there's a way out of that by making that unconsciousness conscious. And that's a very direct path to embodiment, actually, since that's the root of suffering. And in case you, you need to just, if it helps, go read the science. There's a lot of science in the last 10, 15, 20 years showing that the root of a lot of our suffering, mental, physical, is in fact emotional repression. But don't land there. Go and I'll, I'll give you some resources at the end of this to really discover this for yourself. So if we understand that's not really a problem, it's just how our operating system works, 
and also that we don't want to try to get rid of things. And I have a really good, I think, reason for that, if it makes sense to you, is that the suffering that we're experiencing is being created by the emotional repression, what's buried. So if we just try to get rid of the suffering, we're literally bypassing by not getting to the root of it that's producing it. And of course, we would want to get rid of the suffering if we're not getting to the root of it because the suffering sucks. But suffering goes away when you get to the root of it, the true root, with his emotional, which is emotional repression. We don't have to have any intention around that. Our intention, if there's, it's not an intention, it's just awakeness. It's all the work happens in the here and now because that's all there is. And all that we're doing with this work is making unconsciousness here, buried in your body, conscious in the here and now. There's not really a person doing anything. Your mind will tell you that and will put a seeking story up there. But all that's really going on is what you really are. We're pointing to that and showing you that you have repressed emotions still producing suffering. Now, <laughs> That's kind of the dry way of saying it. But think of it this way. You're the only one that can meet your the unmet needs of childhood. Which means that if your suffering has been created by what you've buried, as science says, and your body will tell you, then you can see what happened. You were with parents or others it wasn't safe to feel and express that emotion, so you buried it. Something happened to make you bury that emotion. Once you understand that's a root of suffering, you know that you're the only one that can do it. You didn't even know you had it. It's buried in you, in your body. How can anyone else help you with that? It's buried to you. And you wanted it that way. Remember, we unconsciously create our suffering here. So we bury this stuff unconsciously to protect ourselves. To say that somebody else is going to swoop in and save or fix or change or awaken us when we want to suffer at that deep unconscious level doesn't make any sense, actually. We don't want to feel it. Why am I going to let you in to help me feel it or allow whatever? No, the same mechanism that stops me will stop you. Now, some Excuse me. Some people will feel like... Um, that they need somebody there and that they need teachers. And that's actually true. We do need people in the beginning, but these people should be helping us to meet our own needs. They don't need to come in and, and they can't do it for us, but I can teach you how to make the unconscious conscious. I can't do it for you. But first you want to find out if that's what you want. And if you understand that you buried emotions, and I'm going to show you how to find that out at the end of this podcast. But if you find that out and you have the scientific knowledge around that being the root of suffering, well, then you know you're the only one that can do it. Now you just need skill. And you need a context, like a framework, within which to start processing this. And we're going to give all that to you. But you're the only one, and that's what I want to impress upon you. Does that mean you shouldn't have a teacher? That's not what that means. Does that mean you shouldn't go to a therapist? I'm not saying that. Is that say, am, I, am I saying don't come work with me? I'm definitely not saying that. I'm saying that all of these people in your life, you'll rely on them and give your power away to some degree until you can stand in your own experience and allow all the emotions, including the ones that you buried. Until you get to the buried ones, just like science says, there's going to be suffering because the suffering keeps us safe from what's buried. So as long as you have buried emotions and you're reaching out for help, you must know that you want to suffer on some level. If you don't know that, you'll be reaching out as if somebody else can change that for you when that's within you. And that just needs to be made conscious. So the person that you reach out to should be helping you make that conscious, the part of you that's reaching out because you can't trust your own experience and feel your own feelings. and should be helping you stand on your own two feet eventually because that's what love does. But ultimately it's up to you. And I say to people, look, if you really see that this is the root of suffering and you're serious about it, then what you do is you find out whether you can do this work on your own. 
And if you can't, you just find out why you can't. Because if you think about it this way, we have every reason not to do work on buried emotions because we buried them for a reason. To stay safe and get love. We are not eager to end suffering. We don't want to feel bad. We, we don't like to suffer, but we're not eager to end it if it involves feeling what we buried. We just may or may not know that, that that's really where the bypass is. I didn't know it for 10 years as a teacher and wrote seven books and didn't point to it because it was buried. And I suffered with two diseases after the awakening because that was buried. The root of suffering was still buried. So the only way we can really take, I've got so much to tell you and show you, but let me start with this. Think of it this way. Imagine that we lived in a conscious world where every parent taught and every child learned their own awakeness from a very early age. It was as simple as, it's before walking even. You just know what you are somehow. It's a conscious plan that we don't even recognize that, right? But then after you, rec as a small child, after you recognize that there's this awareness here, you start to see how everything comes and goes. Your parents help you with all of that. Just like teachers or therapists or coaches, they help. But what are we helping you do? In this scenario of this conscious world, this child's going to see that they are this awareness. They're going to know that. And then their parents are going to show them how to feel and allow all their emotions so that they don't suffer. That's what makes the conscious world. Well, we didn't get any of that. And we are not even starting out as adults like those children. We're not starting out as if teachers can just point us to awareness and now we just feel and allow it all. Because we come here with buried stuff. We come here with something that those kids that are born, in this hypothetical at least, don't have, which is trauma. We come with trauma. So those kids are recognizing their awareness and then being taught in this hypothetical to allow everything that comes and goes, which is technically what we would like to be able to do as adults, but we can't. Because repression, which is producing everything that's coming and going, itself doesn't arise. Once you're an adult, it's repression. It's not just like this child, feelings coming and going. The feelings and things that we're experiencing as an adult are coming and going precisely because of what we buried. Emotional repression produces suffering. So as we start with adults taking care of our own needs, I used to think, this is how blind I was, that I could just point to awareness for you. As if a, a parent can just point to the awareness and then everything is fine. Well, it wouldn't be that way in a conscious world because there are emotions here and we can identify with them and get lost in identification. But if our parents tell us to show us how to really feel and allow it all and never bury stuff, we wouldn't identify in that way. Here, we already come identified. We start at a different place and that identification comes from what we buried. If you hold back what's true for you and have done so since you were a child, you're forced to identify with what's false, but also with what's safer than what you buried. And that's why it keeps happening. It's safety. So we just have to talk about meeting our own needs differently than that child growing up in a conscious world who technically would just recognize the awareness and then allow it all from there, having not having to deal with anything buried. We, we can't come here and I can't just point to awareness for you because then you still have the buried stuff and that's what creates the suffering. So us teachers through the years, we got clever and we said, well, okay, it's all coming and going to awareness though. See? As if our answer is still enough, but it's not because there's buried stuff. So we might say, even the sensation that you feel, the contraction in your body, let that be. As if we're teaching a young child to be with their experience. But we have a different experience here as adults. We have a physical contraction, a sense of separation coming from years of holding emotion back, fear and other emotion in our bodies and programming of self-protection with that that creates a physical sense of separation before we get here. 
we can't just rest and let the body be because the body contains all kinds of unconscious programming and repression that makes it feel physical and separate. We can't just rest and let those sensations be. I mean, we can when we're not in inquiry. That's the wise thing to do is just let everything be as it is. But in inquiry, we have to pull up the unconscious conditioning that creates those sensations and contractions because there's our root of suffering. And we can't do that by just resting and allowing everything because that programming doesn't arise. And that's why these sensations persist, these contractions persist for us, and we teachers just keep saying, rest and let that be, or listen to it, but it doesn't produce the repression. <laughs> so what we hear is still safer. And identity thoughts are always safer than buried emotion. That's why when you're sitting with these contractions, even with a teacher or a coach or someone who's skillful, for the most part, the contractions remain. Even if they feel better or there's more expansiveness with the pointing or the meditation, notice how these contractions, and in some case, chronic pain, and other diseases just persist. And there's a good reason for that, because we're not getting to the root of suffering, if we're not, in fact, getting to it. And how would you know if you are? See, the only realization that's worth it is the embodied realization to me. And although that sets up a carrot for all those of us who've been seeking, let's talk about seeking. If we go back to the conscious world scenario, and the child is discovering the, the awareness that they are. Essentially, they're the universe. It's profound and big, but every child is that. See, so that's just something that we get along the way. It's vital to our well-being, but it's also just something we would get, some recognition that would happen if this was a conscious world. And I doubt if that child would say, okay, mom and dad, am I done now? I know that there's awareness here, am I done? The parents would say, there's really no such thing as done. That's one of the thoughts coming and going in awareness. So now you're conscious. Live, be, explore, play, get hurt, feel, allow, see, be. The child wouldn't say, am I done? But as adults, we have every reason when we first start to notice that awareness or start to rest up to say, okay, that's, that's good. I'm done. I, see, I feel the presence here. I mean, it's not embodied yet, right? But a lot of us will kind of just land there. And some teachers will just land there and then point everybody there. Essentially, to that stage of development where the child first learns that they're the awareness, not for the allowing of everything, that hasn't happened yet. And with adults, we can't do that because our stuff is buried. The stuff that creates the suffering is buried. So we're pointing to awareness as adults it's not the same experience as that, hypo that hypothetical because we have the repression. And that child is, not is probably not going to ask, am I done, right? Because, well, the parents would say, well, the reason that you want to be done is there could be something that you don't want to feel, <laughs> right? But if you go feel it, you won't have to fixate on being done. I mean, it would probably never happen in this scenario, but if it did, the parents would point back and say, well, you're just... To something it's just everything is coming and going and something you don't want to feel stays here and because you don't want to feel it you want to be done but you're actually just awake and not feeling something the parent might say then the child feels it stops thinking about being done or not done and lives explores and feels and allows that and it comes and goes, and everything is allowed, nothing sticks, nothing is stored, conscious being. Now, nowhere in that process, really, would the child probably turn back and say, okay, now am I done? Because the parents would say, there is no done. We're just present and conscious and living. <laughs> Eventually, that child would get that, though, if they had that hang up at all, and they would just realize, well, it's certainly not about staying here with mom and dad, just like it's not about staying with the teacher forever. And it's just about living and being conscious and living, though, like actually living now. Relationship, exploring, career, whatever you're going to do on the earth, that's where this path goes. This doesn't go to we're trying to all just be in some done state. 
which comes from repression anyway. The whole idea of being done gets obliterated because all we're looking for is what we are. And we're always this in every moment. And there's a flow of experience in every moment. Done with what? With experiencing? With feeling. That's what we want to be done with. And that's an adult unconscious problem. See? That's our problem. It's not a problem for people in a conscious world who know that the point is just to be conscious. It's a problem in our world. And it comes with a bypass because it comes from repression. I don't want to feel stuff. Let me be done. <laughs> and, th and there comes all the spiritual ego stuff too. Like I'm done, I'm this, I'm that. But if you stay open, you see that our process is actually just like those kids with a twist. We too are the same awareness they are. Recognizing that is just a beginning like it is for them. We want to feel and allow everything just like they do, but we can't because our stuff is buried. And then right there, it's different. And so what I've been saying to people is really, you can't, like that child, just sit now and allow everything and expect to be fully conscious because you have buried stuff. So you just have to enter inquiry, which is different than maybe that child would have to do who hasn't buried stuff. We have to enter inquiry to pull up that conditioning in that physical sense of separation that we feel and find out, discover what is that conditioning that makes us feel that way. And can we transmute that for the real sense of embodied non-duality? Because the core of the ego is in the body. The body keeps the score. Regardless of what our spiritual minds say, our experience will tell us that the body keeps the score and that we must include embodiment for the real freedom. just like that child would include feeling and allowing everything. But for us to do that, we have to bring some of this stuff into awareness that will not come up. Basically, the root of our suffering won't come up unless we prompt it up. And that's really the difference between this work and maybe something else that you're looking at right now out in the world where we're all talking about awakening. Same subject. I'm just saying something happened for me that showed me where the root of suffering was really coming from, and I ended suffering. Here's the other thing. You don't hear it very much. You know? We're just meeting our needs here. You don't hear very much that when you really meet your needs, the suffering stops. I mean, Eckhart says it. He says, look, this is not just about allowing things to come and go endlessly. That stuff stops arising after a while at a certain stage just like it would for those kids. Because you can't have a conscious world and then still everybody suffering. So there wouldn't be suffering for those conscious kids or those conscious beings. We should be looking at that. Are we suffering still? Are we carrying over in time emotions that we're not wanting to feel? And is that producing stories, identities, seeking, pain, depression, anxiety? Look at the science. Yes. Go into your body. Yes. I just want you to remember that you can't meet your needs merely by resting and allowing it all because you can't allow what's buried. And if you want to meet your own needs, in order to end suffering, you really have to meet them. And the needs that we have to meet the most are the ones that nobody met and that we haven't met them either. And this is the stuff that we've buried. I needed somebody when I was a kid to help me feel and express my anger and rage. Those are needs that I had. I needed somebody in a world of homophobia to step aside and say, you know how you're attracted and you feel this way about yourself? It's okay. I didn't get those needs met, so I buried the femininity. And some of the homosexuality for a while, but the femininity, along with the anger. And then getting bullied, I just buried the joy too. And love, the capacity to love, became restricted in my experience because of this repression. Separation came as a really felt sense of 
of uh, coming from these, this repression. I just didn't know that that's where it was coming from all those years. How can you know it until you embody the realization where it's really coming from? I tried to rely on the other teachings, but they just kept pointing me away from what I had buried. So a couple takeaways before we leave here in terms of just meeting your own needs, since you're the only one that can do it, is that you're going to need people in the beginning. In fact, we've created a whole system where we want to mentor you, but whole, wholly for the purpose of you standing in your own experience. It has to go there. If you want to be a conscious child and enjoy your life, it has to go there. You can't be tied to mom and dad or teachers forever. So this work has to be about freeing you for it to have any integrity. It has to be just like that conscious world. But what you might need us for is because some of us have traversed this territory where we tried to meet our own needs, like me, this teacher, through pointing and being, and it didn't work. And now we're reporting it back to you that you can meet a lot of needs by just resting and allowing everything to come and go. You didn't get that when you were a kid either. But what you really didn't get is any care, comfort, compassion, or space for those things that you buried. And those things that you buried, they may not seem like an important part of you because you buried them. And you created, or what got created was an identity that was different than that. Because repression creates identity. If I hold back anger, I present as good and peaceful ego. You can rest with the ego that comes up. Like we say as teachers, just notice these thoughts come and go. You can do all that. Let it all be. But be curious as to why you're an adult who still thinks that you're not good enough or that you're unlovable or that you even have to see all this suffering coming and going, and then where it's coming from. Because to really take care of yourself, you have to learn those extra skills of going down into the contraction and bringing into awareness that which nobody would hold for you, it seemed. And that frankly, we as teachers, we can't really even hold that for you. We can show you how, but it's all you. And it does require skill. And for so many years, people were relying on me to point them, but I can't point to this. You buried this. You have to go find that for yourself to meet your own needs. If you're interested and you haven't started this path, there's a really good way to start it, which is to go to killaby.com and scroll to the bottom of the page, and then you'll see I'll take you through this test that shows you, one, do you have repression? Two, what is it that you buried? And three, how is that producing suffering in your life? Thank you for listening.